afternoon and welcome to the Sunset Safari. For those of you joining us for the first time, my name is Jamie and I have Jean-Dre on camera with me this afternoon. I know many of you were wishing him well with his foot injury. How are you, how's your foot, Jean-Dre? Are you uh, not too bad. battling on? We've got Jean-Dre's walking sticks with us. We've got his crutches with us in the vehicle so that if for some reason he needs to go for a stroll in the bush, he can do so on his crutches. I think more maybe from just the point of view of making his way to and from the car at the beginning and the end of drive. But let's move back to the wildlife. We are coming to you live from Juma and Arathusa Game Reserves in the Sabi Sands, which is in the Greater Kruger National Park of South Africa. Not only, are we and not only are we live, but we're also interactive which means that you can send through questions and comments, whatever you might like to tell us or like to say. And you can send those through on hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. Or you can email through to questions at wildearth.tv. Now, on this another sort of relatively, not quite as hot as yesterday afternoon, but still relatively warm afternoon, 30 degrees centigrade, 86 degrees Fahrenheit. Although compa compared to the summer temperatures we've experienced, it's positively a temperate autumn day out here in the bush. And we've got lots and lots of exciting things planned. I know that Brent is heading back towards Buffleshook and I'm sure he's going to tell you all about his plans there. I don't want to steal his thunder in that respect. Brent's been putting in a great deal of hard work when it comes to relaxing a mystery leopard that has wandered across onto Juma. Very, very different to most of the incredibly relaxed Asabi Sands leopards. Now my plan is to travel along Twin Dams. I've just checked around the lodge. This morning both Brent and myself were just, just that little fraction of a bit, of a second too far behind in terms of following up on alarm calls. Brent's um, slight diversion or detour into a large hole also somewhat impeded his progress. By the time I got there, I had fresh tracks for Karula on the road, a steaming pile of other evidence and no leopard. And she ducked into the drainage line. And my plan now is to go and head across in that direction, just nosy along down the road, see if maybe she hasn't decided to come in the heat of the day out of the drainage line and into the shade. And once we're done looking for the her, we'll go look for the Inkuhuma lionesses at the same time. They're also, I'm sure they're still on the property. I couldn't find a single track moving out. Oh, cobwebs. Uh, Monique in Wales, apparently just before you went live, I'm just trying to catch this spider web so it doesn't go all over the camera. You were desperately asking if I could please, please tell you the name of the eagle that you were just watching on the Juma Dam camera. Oh, hello. Is this him, Monique? Just checking. I think Jerry's exact quote was, I think it might be a Warburg's there watching, but I'm not sure. And no, she didn't, sorry. She said, don't quote me on that. Oops, sorry, Jerry. My mistake. Uh, looking at this eagle, it's not a Wahlberg's. Or if it is, a very scruffy one. It's interesting. Let me just do some thinking quickly. I feel as though I'm missing something obvious. Maybe it is a Wahlberg's and it's just a funny angle. I've never seen a wall cut Wahlberg's this grey colour before. No, it's a juvenile. Has its feet... Let me just grab my binoculars. Does it look as though its feet has got, have got feathers? No. That beak definitely looks juvenile to me. In fact, like the whole motley colouring. My instinct is a juvenile fish eagle but a very, very motley juvenile for sure. It doesn't seem to have quite enough brown, which is why I didn't immediately chat about that. No, mm, not quite right either. Not quite mottled enough. 
And his head does seem as though it's starting to go lighter in colour. Oh, no, there's that crest. Maybe it is just our pale morph. Warburg's looking peculiar. No, it is, it is a Warburg's. I'm sorry. Looking at it closely now, it is a Warburg's. A pale morph Warburg's, it just looks very peculiar from... I don't think we've looked at them properly from this angle. For a juvenile fish eagle, not quite the right amount of white on it. All right, so there you go, Monique. It is the juvenile... I mean, sorry. It is the pale morph Warburg's eagle. And I got completely distracted, but that's what you were looking at. There you go. Answer for you, Monique. Had me a little bit fooled just because it's looking so hot and scruffy. It is panting as well. I wonder, apparently the, the reason I came across in this region was because there were alarm calls around the lodge earlier. And I just wanted to follow up. I wonder if a lot of them were not in response to this eagle. Although he does spend a lot of time around here. <laughs> and as we move on from our lovely eagle and go off in search of some bigger predators, Yvonne has possibly suggested that perhaps the lions are going to view Jandre or be thinking about catching Jandre. This car and its power. Thinking about catching Jandre, um, since he is somewhat lame. <laughs> what do you think, Jandre? Perhaps we should. No, we can't really do that. Oh, it's definitely a Warburg's from this angle. It's a much better angle to have a look at it from. You can see the crest on the top of the head and the very square tail at the back. Beautiful colouring in this afternoon light. I assume this is what the damn camera was looking at. Well, it must have moved because if I would be incredibly impressed if the damn camera could reach all the way or look all the way here. There's so many trees in the way. That's very impressive. Now, one thing that I've neglected to mention in my introduction and something that I was discussing a little bit earlier with the other guys is that we will be changing times as of the 1st of April. And so what I'm going to do is we're going to help you out. We've prepared all the different time zones and what the start times will now be. It will, the drive will shift, to give you the basic version, the drive will shift half an hour later in the morning. So from six o'clock as opposed to half past five. And it will shift to half an hour earlier in the afternoon. So half past three in the afternoon to half past six. So what we basically do is try and shift or go with the sunrise and the sunset for each drive. And at the moment we are spending a considerable amount of time driving in the dark in the mornings and driving in the dark after or towards the end of the sunset safari in the afternoon. I'm just going to go on to quarantine quickly. There was an elephant here when I first went across. See if he's still here. If he's not, then I'll just read those times to you directly. If he is, then we'll look at him while I read those times to you directly. I know that things do get a little bit confusing with different time zones, which is one of the reasons why I have to read what times the start times will be from now. smell an elephant and I can see evidence of an elephant but I no longer see an elephant I wonder where he has moved off to all right
right, I'm going to stop quickly well, before going off in search of Karula and other wonderful animals and just let you know exactly what the times are again. I'm going to hand Jandre his phone so that he can unlock said phone for me so that I can read you the times. <laughs> Thanks, Jandre. <laughs> okay, so here we go. The Sunrise Safari will start at 6 o'clock Central African time until 9 o'clock, which puts it at midnight Eastern time or 9 o'clock p.m. on Pacific time. Then the Sunset Safari, half past 3 at Central African time, which will be half past 9 in the morning Eastern time and half past 6 in the morning Pacific time. I really hope that helps you all. We'll be repeating that message a little bit towards the end of the Sunset Safari. In the meantime, I think that Brent would like to say a very good afternoon to you all. So, guys, we're here in the position of this very unrelaxed male leopard. We just came to see if he might be in the tree. I'm just going to have a quick look. If not, we're going to come back when it's much later. I just want to keep him being used to vehicles driving past. So always good. So Vim, if you see that Marula in the middle there, in the lower fork. So my name is... Oh, has he moved the car? Again, let's just go forward slightly. He might have moved it into a place easier to feed. I'm sorry, Vim, I'm making you look in the wrong Marula tree. Carcass is still there. This big one through there. But it doesn't look like he is in the tree. I'm just going to find a gap so we can have a look. This is very exciting having a new leopard, and specifically one that's not very relaxed. Uh, the carcass is still there. He's not in the tree, so we're going to keep moving past just slowly, just so he gets used to the sound of cars. So it is very exciting. We'll definitely be back here a little bit later. Wait, what was that? Did I spot him? But you, see, you can see the carcass. I'll get Vim to zoom in now. You got the gap there, Vim. You can just see the carcass hanging in the bowel there. So he's probably sleeping. It is still quite hot. So we're going to keep sneaking past. I was hoping he might be lying in the shade a bit closer to the, the road, but he's not. So we're going to leave this area. And uh, I'm Brent Leo Smith. I have Vim on camera with me. And we have found a new leopard in the last couple of days, and we've been spending our time trying to habituate him to the vehicles to stop him running away. So even though we didn't see him this time, it's just good to just drive past. I'm pretty confident we might get a nice visual after dark. So very exciting times. Well, Video Mark is taking bets on whether we might see the ghost leopard or uh, the Birmingham boys today. I think, Video Mark, we've got a much better chance at seeing the leopard. The Birmingham boys are right down to the south of us, uh, near the Mala Mala boundary this morning, and I doubt they've moved during the heat of the day. Spending quite a bit of time around this area with this new leopard who's not, uh, not relaxed around the vehicles. And Lenny in Pennsylvania is wondering, is, would this mean he's more likely to attack vehicles? Actually, the opposite, Lenny. So uh, he's more likely to run away from vehicles or people. So he's a lot more skittish. So uh, 
are less likely to attack uh, than a relaxed leopard. So I'm hoping we find some nice ellies. I didn't think we saw any nice elephants this morning, so definitely worth having a squiz about, checking down near the Mawati River system and some of the mud wallows, see if we can find some elephants playing in the mud. So it is beautiful at the moment. We're having these incredibly clear skies and uh, still quite hot days, but very chilly mornings. You can see not a cloud in the sky at the moment. But chilly mornings, and it's going to be interesting to see how much the temperature drops this evening. It has been dropping at night, not as visible as the mornings. It's been cool, but not cold towards the end of the sunset safaris. I haven't had to put a jersey on it in the evenings just yet, but I think the time is coming. In New Hampshire has got an interesting nickname for the ghost. I think I actually quite prefer it to the, the ghost, um, but it is the phantom. Uh, and Darlene would uh, like to know if a vehicle came in and didn't sort of take the same precautions we're doing as we, as we approach, uh, would it undo all the, the work we've done? Uh, it certainly wouldn't undo all the work, but it would make things a little bit difficult. But that's why we communicate on the radio. And that's why at the moment, uh, that's a one vehicle sighting, if it is, and on the road only, no off-roading. And um, I will go and have a look later on tonight and then uh, decide whether we open it up or we keep it zoned. So it all just depends and like with everything, communication is key. Now, Jackie in Chicago is wondering, how do we name this leopard? Who gets to name him since he's not a cub? Well, Jackie, I'm not sure. We actually uh, had a chat with Candice today. And if he hangs around, he'll probably have to hang around for a few more months before we, we actually decide to give him a, a proper name instead of a, a bunch of nicknames. But uh, it'll probably be at discretion of the landowners uh, in discussion with the person who first saw him. Now, with a leopard like this, it's difficult. I think we've all seen him, but no one's really had good views. So we'll probably just leave it up to Tax and, and Orbs uh, to name him if, we, if he does stay around. So you can see wonderful greenery around us. So, hi, a Gork, on, who's a new viewer, a brand new viewer, hi, Gork, is wondering, do I answer questions from Twitter or email or from chat as well? Well, I'm not sure, to be 100% Gork. Uh, <laughs> the questions come through to me from the wonderful ladies in Final Control. So, uh, as far as I know, I think we might do chats. I'll wait for them to confirm with me. But definitely Twitter and email. There we go. So Gork, they do keep an eye uh, on, on YouTube, but Twitter and email are definitely their preferred favorites. So if you definitely want your questions to get through, uh, better to use Twitter or email. 
And if you're not sure, the email address is questions at wilder.tv or use the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. Andrew, who's in the Ukraine, and Andrew would like to know where are the leopards bigger, in uh, Namibia or the Kruger National Park? I would have to say on average, Andrew, it is probably going to be the Kruger National Park. And the low felt is particularly large leopards. Now, Namibia, the majority of Namibia is, is, is arid and desert, so there's not as much food available to them. So generally, your bigger leopards will be where the best food supplies are. Now, saying that, there will probably be some very large individuals on the Caprivi, uh, on the big river systems there. But I'd say, on average, the leopards will be bigger in the low felt of South Africa. Joan in England says uh, he thinks I should name the leopard Brent, then it'll be Brent Leopard. Uh, ha 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 ha. Uh, strangely enough, Steph said the same thing today when I was telling him about this leopard. He said you should just call it Brent. Now I'm hoping we can find one or two migrant bird species for you that haven't skedaddled just yet. I've been keeping an eye out for the last woodlands of uh, the season. But it seems I was like, oh, we've got a day or two, we've got time. But since, since then, I actually haven't seen one. Viram, have you seen a woodlands in the last two drives? I have. You have? This morning. Ah, this morning. But they have stopped calling. I haven't heard them calling. But we will keep our eye open. And I have been going back to check on that white-throated robin chat that we saw for the first time a few days ago. So I think maybe that's a good idea to do now. But in the meantime, Jamie has a little bundle of joy to show you. You've got the cutest little baby Anyala, and it's going to walk out straight in front of us. Let's just wait. Come on, little one. You can follow mom. It's okay. It's okay. Here we go. <laughs> oh, that is a tiny, brand new Nyala. That little thing can't be more than a day or so. Look at that high walk. Pick your knees up. <laughs> that little thing cannot be more than maybe a day or two old. That is so tiny. Hey, cutie. I'm glad you're going that way and not back towards where Karula is. She, you'd be a bite-sized snack for her. You'd be a starter. Here comes the magnificent male in hot pursuit. Such a vast difference between the males and the females. And it's so hard to imagine that that tiny little thing depending on if it's male or female, could actually grow into a big Nyala bull of that size and stature. That was, that's definitely made the start to my afternoon. That was so cute. There goes mom. Baby will be quick to follow. Here you go, little one. Oh, such a tiny little thing. I'm trying to think of a good comparison to give you a good sense of scale. It could only be a couple of kilograms in weight. There's the big male, who by contrast is the size of maybe a small pony, maybe just a little bit smaller than that. Whereas that little that little 
creature, that little Nyala that just walked past, what would we say? Probably a little bit larger than a fox terrier. Quite, I mean, height-wise, about that big, about a foot and a half at its head height. So cute. That's a nice way to start. And it's walking away from where Karula's tracks went into the straight line. And already such a coordinated antelope, you know, for a couple of days old and walking with that high step that the little ones are all demonstrate, all of the antelope species that live in this dense riverine vegetation demonstrate a very high step so that they don't trip over the various obstacles that are in their way. That was such a special sighting. I think that's the smallest Inyana that I've seen since I started doing or working at Juma. We get a very, we can see a very, very clear distinction between the male and the female in Yala. The male, of course, much larger, much darker. It's in fact the largest sexual dimorphism of any antelope species. And we have a question about whether or not, however, you could tell the difference between a male and female youngster. And I'm just pulling over to the side here. This was what we encountered this morning on the road while we were attempting to track Karula. Sorry, I will get back to that Nyala question. Now, when I came around the corner following those alarm calls, that was still fresh and warm. That, by the way, is leopard scat. And you can see just on the right of that, where I've scraped the ground, that was my marker for the last track that I had for Karula before she walked off into probably the densest, densely, most densely vegetated block that we have here. I mean, it is so thick in there. I walked, I followed the tracks on foot towards the drainage line, but in that vegetation, I could have stepped 10 meters away from her, and if she didn't move, I probably would not have seen her. You know how tricky it can be to see lepers at the best of times. I'm trying to look for one in there. But she is in there. She is in there somewhere. And the next plan is to go through the drainage line and then up onto the road on the other side of the bank and see if we can't figure out where she went from there. Oh, well, that little baby in Yala would have been perfect, easy prey for a leopard like Karula, who seems to prefer the the smaller antelope, the Daker and the Steenbok, although she has been making light work of the baby antelope at the moment. She's had a baby kudu, baby waterback, going for the slightly less experienced ones. But back to that Inyala, quickly, Miss Lebobob, no. If there is no way to tell the difference between a male and a female Inyala when it is that young. They both have that, both sexes have that light tan color of a young Nyala lamb. So the same color as the females. And that's because it actually acts as a better camouflage approach than that of the males. And it's only when they reach a couple of months old that they start to become a slightly shaggier around the neck. There's a bit more fur. And you'll maybe start to see the tips of the horns poking through. I mean, already our baby Impala from December, in January, have got their little horns poking through. So give it a couple of months and you would be able to tell with that in Yala. But when they're born, there's no clear difference between the males and the females. about that. 
Kathy, who's watching on YouTube. Kathy wants to know, Nyala, is that part of the antelope genus? And it's part of the antelope family, part of the ruminata order, so in other words, the ruminants. And it forms, falls into a family, and Nyala forms into a family known as the spiral-horned antelope family. So Trafalagus, and in this case, Angazi, Trafalagus, I don't know. It's a long, complicated story involving somebody who was trying to classify the different animals and asked one of his local guides what they called the Nyala, and he said, Angaz, he'd never seen one before. And so it became, and Angaz means I don't know in Zulu. And thus the Nyala became the Trafalagus spiral horned antelope, I don't know which one, essentially, in its Latin name. Sorry, I just want to be on the Game Drive channel for one second. check Vulture's Nest Road, see if maybe she didn't come up on that side of the Mawati drainage. Last tracks go into the drainage line itself from Twin Dams, about 100 meter, 200 meters north of the Chele Pan area. Copy that, thank you. Just giving a little bit of an update and maybe the best ways to go about searching for Karula. So the spiral horned antelope family in this particular area includes the bushbuck, which is a slightly smaller, in my opinion, even prettier version of the Inyala without quite so many stripes and not quite that vivid tan color. There's also their larger kudu cousins, the kudu antelope. And then the large, it also includes the largest antelope species in the world, which is the elant. Now we don't tend to see them here. We could, in theory, well spotted Jandre. A very large leopard tortoise, almost rubbed smooth and pretending at the moment to be a rock. <laughs> Frozen is a good approach to camouflage. Uh, can you see them rubbed smooth like that and bleached relatively, not colorless, but the colors have definitely faded. There we go. See, not a rock, definitely not a rock. Although it is doing a passable impression of one. This must be a relatively old and uh, roll. Oh, start again. An older tortoise. Leopard tortoise can live for very long periods of time. Of course, the Galapagos tortoises, which are related to them, are famed for living well over a hundred years. The leopard tortoise doesn't have quite that ex life expectancy, but have been recorded living up to 70 years old. If I had to hazard a guess at how old this one was, it's difficult. I would say well over 25, even older than that possibly. They're very slow growers. An awesome spot by Jandre. And a very strange movement to him, this one though. Can't decide if it's just because of the way he's walking through the grass or if he actually has some kind of injury. No, I think it may be just getting through this thick grass. Of course, with all of the rains, we've been seeing more and more tortoise species out and about. The main ones being the leopard tortoise, of course, and the speaks hinge tortoise. This is a particularly large one. And just look at that. I mean, if he didn't move, or if he didn't move, you would barely know that he was there. Look at how green everything is. It's like being in a different world. 
cool. Absolutely awesome. Well done, Jandre. Thank you. Our Susie started watching on the 1st of March. And Susie is just saying how this place has transformed from when she started watching up until now. And it really has. It is like a different... It's being, like being on a different planet almost. Quarantine was starting to look a little bit like a desert almost. There was hardly any grass there. We weren't seeing groundwater in one of the pans or one of the areas. And now as we come through the spaghetti junction area, it's peppered with a whole lot of different watering holes or potential watering holes for the different animals. And it does mean that our general game is a little bit more spread out. But it is such a wonderful sight for those of us that have been watching the animals struggle to find food. So whilst it's not going to fix the drought, it is going to go some way towards mitigating its effects. And then there's even water still in these pans here. There's lots of water here. Now, we were just finishing off our conversation about the Nyala and the way that they fit into the antelope family tree. Antelope species are divided actually technically not so much into families, although that's the colloquial term that we use, but more into tribes. Now out here, Sandy, you were wondering about how many different antelope species you can see. It's something I count, count regularly but keep forgetting the conclusion that I come to. So let's just do it once again quickly. Let's do the spiral horned. Elant, I'm not going to count the elant. We could see them here. They do occur in this greater Kruger National Park area. So there's no fences between us and the elant population. But the chances of them moving down south into this area is relatively slim. So let's go with kudu, nyala, bushbuck, wildebeest, waterbuck, sable. The first sable was seen for the first time in 17 years. A sable was seen on the Juma Dam camera. Roan will count, although it's unlikely, and sesame will count, although it's unlikely. And impala, a Stienbok, a Daker, a Sharps Kreisbok, a Reedbok. And I think I've come, across, come to the conclusion that there's 13. I think I've missed out one or two. Just racking my brains as to what those could be. Now that might be about right. A rough estimate of about 13 of the antelope species that you could see. You're less likely, to be completely honest, you're less likely to see sesame, roan antelope, or the sable. But never say never. Stranger things have happened. And the drought is going to be bringing in some different animals to the ones that we have seen in the past. Let's go into the Mwati drainage line on a river cruise and see if we can't see any sign of Karula. It's trying to avoid the hole that Brent managed to fall into this morning. I'm sure she's around here somewhere. It's just a question of where, and this particular route that we're following now is a beautiful spot, but it does have a limit. There's a fallen jackalberry tree at the end where we can't go any further. But I'm more than happy to just be spending some time in the drainage line. First of all, to have signal here is an absolute pleasure. Our tech team have been working furiously on Wendy and she is back up to her old self again. But also it's just a beautiful spot to come in this afternoon light with everything so lush and green. 
that is exceptionally beautiful. I'm going to check really, really carefully, and once I get to the end of the drainage line, then I'm going to have to turn around and return back again, quite possibly driving all the way back in reverse. So while I concentrate on checking for Carilla, let's find out how Brent's afternoon is going. So, Fiam and I are biding our time before we can head back uh, towards that leopard. So we decided to come have a look around Twin Dams, and we found ourselves a group of old buffalo bulls, including a particularly strange-looking individual uh, that has, we've seen a couple of times, I've actually seen him evade the Incahumas. He's quite a small-bodied buffalo, but he's got a very distinctive boss. And he always looks a little bit more bemused and slow than the other buffalo, except he mustn't be because he keeps getting away from the lions and the other... Surprise! And I must say, she really was a surprise. I did not see her at all until she got up and moved out of the sand of the drainage line. And there she is, the queen of Juma herself. We are so fortunate. This is exactly where we were looking for her this morning. Hello, Karula. It's been a long time since I've seen you, girl. She's looking very, very warm. I'm just going to let her lie down again before we reposition to get a different view. Oh, she's got a kill. She's got a kill. She's got a, what has she got? It's a baby in Yala after that conversation that we've just had. And she's eaten most of it. She was just having a little bit of a break in the sand, and that's why she got up and moved in that direction. This is incredible. Right where we were looking this morning. No wonder we couldn't find her. She was on the hunt, and she's already managed to consume about half of it. All right. Now that she's settled, let's go for a little bit of a change of view. Awesome. We knew we were going to find her this afternoon. It was just a question of how. Guys, we're going to stop here. It's not the best view, but any closer and we are going to unsettle her, which obviously I don't want to do. Just because there isn't much leeway in this drainage line to shift around. So we're just going to stop and let her feed away. And I can actually see, sorry, I can see the bird that's making that loud whistle. Chandra, are you going to be able to get that bird on camera? It's at the top of the tree and it's whistling. It's caught. I can see it very clearly from my angle. I'm not sure if you can. Mm -hmm. If you follow the, the branch at the back, Go just below where that branch curves up, or to the left, just under there and behind there. He's there somewhere. Let's go down a little bit for me, please. And to the right. Where is he? I can see him from my perspective. But from yours, it's a little bit more tricky. Okay, I'll keep I will keep an eye on him. I just want it because we don't often get to see that particular bird. It's a grey-headed bush shrike. Here we go. Let's go back to her. She's very, very tucked away. I just want to get hold of the guys on the Game Drive channel and just let them know that we have her. Brent's offered to manage it for us. But I just want to update him about where she is. Brent for Jamie. Copy that, thank you. Um, she's right in the middle of the drainage line here, uh, exactly where I saw you turn around this morning. Visual is, at the moment, 
One out of five, and I think only space for two vehicles in here. Here we go. This, in some ways, a shot like this is one of the most beautiful ways to see a leopard. With the dappled sunlight in the green. This is so wonderful to see the Queen of Juma with a very round belly with food for herself and therefore food for her cubs as well when she returns to suckle them. And she's made short work of this kill because she did not have this kill when I drove through here this morning. Or if she did, it was further up outside of the drainage line. I definitely didn't see her. It's exactly where I saw Nyala, but I didn't see her. So she's made that kill sometime after the sunrise safari and then managed to devour at least half of it. It's such a... <laughs> it's all overpowered by the whistle of the grey-headed bushrike that I was trying to show you earlier. It's so incredibly loud for such a mysterious and cryptic little bird that is so incredibly secretive. And I'm so chuffed to have seen Karula. It's been such a long time since I last saw her. My last sighting was a very brief one when she was on Gowrie, Maine with her cubs. Oh, awesome. Perfect. Thank you, girl. Even better. Shame. So one little Inyala, not quite as lucky as the one we saw before. There she goes. I'm chewing now with those large carnassial teeth, the molars at the back of her jaw, that have a particularly large amount of strength, very, very deep root systems, and a scissor-like cutting edge so rather than trying to use her incisors to nibble off little bits of meat and risk damaging them or her canines, she uses those incredibly, incredible biting shears at the back part of her jaw. And then every now and again, using that rasping tongue with the spines on it to lick and clear flesh, at least lift it up a little bit so that she can chew. But hot. Taking a quick, quick break. Oh, Brent was just chatting to you about the presence of this male leopard, and I know he has touched on the possibility of him being a threat to her cubs, which is the way that nature works. Hopefully, Karula will be lucky enough and canny enough to keep her cubs from him. I think she will be. I wonder if he's not one of the other reasons why she didn't choose to den further south. But Michelle, we're about, 
probably about a two-kilometer distance. I'm not 100% sure where Brent is with that kill or was with that kill, but I know that it is sort of with about on the, just on the boundary of our property. Shame, she's so hot, panting away. So, Michelle, close to about a mile away from where Brent was, that's where Karula is now. Her cubs, we suspect, we don't know for certain, but we suspect are just south of our southern boundary. So about the same distance in the opposite direction to where we are now. Now, I don't have any news for you in terms of where she is denning at the moment or whether or not she has brought her cubs back onto Juma. We thought initially that because of the way that she was behaving, the way that she was crossing backwards and forwards across Gauri Main, that possibly she might have, I can't get over how loud that bird is, um, she might have moved her cubs on into a drainage line on the southern section of Juma. That being said, I think we've since discounted that. There's no tracks of her going backwards and forwards in there. Even, you know, we haven't gone deliberately to investigate, but even on the roads around that area, we haven't seen any tracks. The only tracks move backwards and forwards from Gowrie, Maine. So she's probably still denning on little Gowrie. Beyond that, there was a very brief sighting of them about a week ago, I think, or maybe a couple of days ago from in one of the Elephant Plains guides. We haven't seen them. We haven't seen them. We haven't specifically gone looking for them. And at some point, if she is obliging and she, if she does get up and move, we'll be able to see if there's fresh suckle marks. And I think her movements from now will be vital in determining exactly where, exa where exactly she's got those cubs hidden. Ooh, that was a yucky mouthful. Now, Jill, watching in the UK, please don't think that your question is silly at all. It's not a silly question. And there's very few questions that I would consider particularly silly, actually, come to come down to it. But Jill wanted to know what it means exactly when I said that um, Brent would manage the sighting for me. So what that means, Jill, is it's not just us operating here, as I'm sure you know. There are other lodges and there are other vehicles driving guests around that would love to come and share in this experience. So when a guide finds a sighting like this, as we just did, it is our job, I wouldn't really call it a job, I mean it's our pleasure to be able to call the other guides in and to allow them to, oh she's trying to get rid of the fur, look at that on her tongue. Hot and full bellied. Sorry, Jill. Be with you in one sec. Just waiting to see what she would decide to do. So yes, when we find a sighting like that, like this, it is our pleasure to call in another vehicle. But there is a limit to how many vehicles can be in a sighting. <coughs> the standard is three. So three vehicles watching an animal. No more than that. A lot of the time that gets reduced to two or sometimes even one. In the situation like where we are now, I've asked Brent to manage it, so to control who comes in when, so that we don't get a whole load of cars coming in at once. At the same time, I've had to reduce it to a two vehicle sighting because there's no space for more than that. And there's barely enough space here for two of us, let alone three. And sort of see how restricted we are in terms of where we are next to the drainage line. Just give me one second. 
and I'm just thinking a little bit about backing up a bit so that another vehicle can come and join us. Here we go, thanks, Brent. So yes, basically it's people asking for directions, people asking when they can come and join you, people asking, etc., for any kind of updates on the sighting. And for us to present and to watch the animal and to control the sighting can occasionally get tricky, especially whilst we're listening through one earpiece to both the Game Drive channel and your questions. Oh, is she going to take it up a tree? Is she going to take it into this tambuti? Come on, girl. That's a good idea. There you go, Diana. You were wondering if she was going to hoist it into the tree. I'm hoping she does. Come on, girl. It's just, I just want to wait for a moment to see what she decides to do. I know that she's hidden through the bushes, but the only available path takes me quite close to where she wants to go. So I just want to see which way, which way she wants to move. She is looking up into the tree and that Tambuati would be a perfect spot for her to hide a kill like this. She's picked it up again. Oh, no, she's going. Here she goes. She's going to take it up into the tree. There she goes. Awesome. Yay, that's exactly what we want to see. So that she doesn't run the risk of losing it to any raging lions or hyenas. Well done, Karuna. She's just trying to find a good spot to put it. Keeps wanting to fall down. <laughs> you don't think about how much skill and coordination and strength something like that takes for a leopard. Oh, she's going to try even further up. And that's perfect because it does give us a better position from which to view the sighting. Awesome. Robert, you were wondering as she makes her descent. And I think she's trying to find a nice, comfortable spot to go lie down. You were wondering, is there a point at which that kill will go past its prime and make her ill from eating it? And the answer is, I've seen leopards scavenge five-day-old carcasses that are green and steaming with maggots. There's a little bit of confusion, guys, on the Game Drive channel. I just want to see if we can get, if they need to get hold of me. She's going to come back down. Chris, Chris. Stand by one, Chris, sorry. Negative, Chris. Um, I think my best way to give you directions is to come from Spaghetti Junction into the Milwati and then move north from there. 
Um, there's a large Tambueti thicket that she's just twisted her kill into. Copy that, no problem. There she goes, just covering up the remains of the carcass in order to hide the scent. And I think she's actually going to go for a walk. She's either going to find a different patch of shade or she's going to go and have a drink. behind the car. There she goes. Is she gonna lie down in that patch? That's where I first found her. <laughs> Karula, are you going to lie down behind my car? Yes. Good girl. There we go. Back into her patch. Cool. Okay. Um, this is relatively tricky at this point. Since, well, Jandre, you've got an okay view for now. I would like to turn around, but this is very close to where Brent got stuck. It's not all that easy to do. So we'll watch her for now. <laughs> we do have a lovely view of her cleaning herself off. Uh, Joan? In Washington, looking at this beautiful view that we have of her coat and those incredible rosettes that are so typical of a leopard in this area. You were just wondering, because you've read that leopards' rosettes are square in the south and round in the east. And you were wondering if that were the case. And to be completely honest, it's not something I've ever heard. Um, I hadn't read about that. Yes, there will definitely be color differences and physical differences in the appearance of leopards in different areas. Some are genetically larger, some genetically smaller. It makes sense that the spot patterns would be slightly different. I hadn't realized that there was a square versus round comparison. Although looking at her rosettes from the angle that we are, I can sort of see maybe you could describe them as a square. Honestly, that is not an article or information that I had encountered just yet. Look at her having such a good clean after her kill. Meticulous animals, leopards. And Cat in Tampa wasn't quite the sense of scale that I was imagining when I was trying to describe the little Inyala earlier, but Cat in Tampa's right. Watching Karula hoist that baby does give you a really good sense of scale. So Cat, yep. I mean, she's also eaten half of it, or more than half of it by the looks of things. The entire back half is now gone, and she's just left with the thoracic space and the head and the shoulders. But it does really give you an idea of just how tiny they really are. And also, just how ravenous she's feeling as a mum, that in the last few hours she's managed to consume that amount of meat. Even a little Inyala like that must weigh, maybe, what would I guess? If Karula weighs roughly the same as me, maybe a little bit larger, let's put her at being quite short but quite stocky, 50 odd kilograms, so 100, kilo, 100 pounds or just over 100 pounds. And a Nyala like that is probably weighs just under 20, maybe 15. 
So 35 to 40 pounds. Now that is about a third of her weight that she has managed to consume half of. So she's eaten a sixth of her body weight in the last few hours, if you followed my maths there. Which is very impressive. I don't think I could manage that. I've made jolly good attempts at times. Oh, flies bugging her. Just going to find a, there we go, a nice patch to lie down there. Bear with me one second. I just want to listen to how close the other vehicle is. And Charles, once you pass that tributary, tributary with the fallen buffalo thorn on your left, as you're coming up the drainage line, just come nice and slowly. She's just moved off the sand onto the side and it's on a blind corner. Um, once you've passed that tributary on your left, I've got your audio. Once you've passed that tributary on your left with the large buffalo thorn, um, just come quite slowly. She's very close to the drainage line itself and it's quite a blind corner. She's hidden behind a bush, although you should see me first. Copy that. It's about 50-odd metres north in that drainage line. You can start to slow down. All right. Let's just see if we can maybe turn around. Might make life a little bit easier, particularly if she does decide to get up and move off, although I don't think she's going to. I think she's going to rest quite happily in the shade. We could get... It could, it could get interesting. Um, the sand's quite thick and it is quite churned up ahead of me. But it's the only spot really to turn around. Okay, let's go across to Brent so that I can turn around. I'll be back with you shortly. So VM and I are playing the game that I've played many times in my life in these situations with male and female leopards that are not used to cars. We're playing the patience game. So we're parked probably about 70 meters from where the carcass is in the tree. And we're just waiting patiently, uh, having a chat, just being in the area, talking, uh, just getting him used to the sound of human voices, and hopefully, when it gets a bit darker, we're going to have to. I'm going to have a much better view of him. He's probably going to be much more relaxed in the dark. A lot of leopards are. They'll run during the day, but will sit a little bit longer at night. So, very exciting. And and as exciting as it is to to be with a new leopard, it does take an awful lot of patience and quite a lot of sitting uh, still for long periods of time to habituate them. But it is such a rewarding experience if we if we win through with that. But isn't that amazing? Uh, Jamie's got Karula with a, a kill, and uh, almost exactly where I got stuck here this morning. Very interesting. So Sarah, welcome back. Sarah is a regular who's 18 years old in the higher. She just says, school's been keeping her away from the drives recently. And would like to know, is this a new leopard or Gajima? Uh, very difficult to say. I've never seen Yorsa's photographs of what the leopard he calls Gajima yet. Um, it's a young male between four and five years old is my estimate. So more than likely he's come in from the Kruger National Park. Uh, and that particular area of the Kruger doesn't have any commercial operations or, or game drive roads or tourist roads near there. So we're probably looking at 
that uh, it could be the one they call Kojima. I have seen another unrelaxed male, uh, but who's much bigger than this guy. So uh, difficult to say, uh, but who knows? But it is really exciting and, uh, and it is, hopefully we'll, we'll get a good view of him later. And then if we do, I can compare some photographs with yours to check spot patterns. We got, can hear an African grey hornbill calling. <whistles> One of my favourite calls up on the crests. Let's see if I can spot him. There he is, see him there? Top of that little marula on the right hand side. A little bit to the right. Oh, he was top of that marula on the right hand side. You can hear him disappearing as he flies. Now, this is a very good question from Diana. Would this new leopard ever be nervous enough to abandon his kill? And it is possible, and I have seen it happen before. Just from his behavior so far, I don't think so. And um, the fact that I walked into him twice yesterday right next to his kill, and he still didn't abandon it, is a good sign that he's, he's not gonna abandon this kill. He will come back. And uh, it is a great, there's still quite a lot of meat left on it. And it's quite a big kill for a, a, a leopard, a, a sub-adult kudu. Probably smaller, smaller than a sub-adult, but a young kudu. So a lot of meat and not worth wasting. So he actually stored the kill just behind where we're sitting now yesterday. And then as it got dark last night, he moved it off into that tree. And I have been checking with my binoculars just under the tree and in the shadows there, seeing if we catch a, a glint of a, a ear flick or a tail swish. But it doesn't look like he's been up to feed during the day today. It has been quite hot, so that's probably why. So I think he will definitely be quite hungry by the time night time comes. He could also have meandered off for a drink, but we will be here, and if anything happens, uh, we will jump back across. But isn't this incredible? We've got potentially two different leopards on the sunset safari. So let's go have a look at the Queen of Juma, Queen Karula. Here we go. We managed to turn around without any incidents whatsoever. And in fact, we found ourselves sort of positioned very much on the drainage line wall. I could see where Brent got stuck, where he'd managed to jack himself up and put some branches under the car. It's not stuck. He's right. It's not stuck until you've had to call someone to rescue you. Then you've been properly stuck. He managed to get out himself. But I'm glad that we didn't follow the same fate. <laughs> Look at this, this crested Franklin. It's a very brave bird. Perhaps it knows that with that full belly, Karula's not going to be up too much. Very common to see them do this. I mean, the Franklin has seen her, but she's not displaying any kind of predatory behavior. So she's not a threat to them. It's the same with Tingana and the the guinea fowl. Marilyn, now that we've repositioned, Marilyn was wondering if our grey-headed bushrike is still there. I'm really sorry, Marilyn, it flew away as we turned around. Oops. <laughs> she, looked, she just looked at them and they got a fright. You can see her tail swishing away at the flies. She's got a very contented expression or body language, apart from the odd snap at an irritating, biting, stable fly. Now, Robert is a new viewer watching in Edinburgh, Scotland. 
close to where my brother's just come home from school. Robert was wondering how long we've known this leopard because she seems so comfortable in our presence. Robert, I've known her since I first arrived here about, personally, about eight months ago. I've known of her for a lot longer than that, and a lot of our viewers have been watching this particular leopard for a vast majority of her lifespan, actually. Now, she's 12 years old at the moment. She's been watched and observed from birth right up until now. Her mother, the safari female, was quite well known as well, and this was the sort of the heartland of her territory. And Karula then took over this portion of her mom's territory, as female leopards do. They tend not to disperse as far away from the, their mothers as the males do, which makes sense. It's almost like a feudal system where she's carved, the, the mother carves out the spaces for her daughters. And Shadow, I mean, Karula's done exactly the same thing for her daughters, Shadow and Tundi, both of whom have territories on the border of hers. Shadow to the west and Tundi to the south. Oh, the reason that she is so comfortable with our presence, there's a couple of different reasons. One, we've given her plenty of space. Two, we are not shouting or talking loudly or making a tremendous amount of noise. But most importantly, it's all part of this whole process that Brent is currently going through with the leopard that is clearly not from an area like this. That nervous phantom leopard clearly hasn't become used to cars in the same way that the amount of work and effort that has gone into habituating these animals to the presence of safari vehicles. And it gives us an opportunity to observe her behavior in completely unaffected by our presence, so her natural behavior, as well as the fact that it brings tourists in that will pay the money that's necessary, not just for the conservation of Karula or leopards in general, but the wildlife of the Kruger National Park area and the Sabi Sands in particular. So this level of habituation is relatively normal. It's very important to read the body language correctly and to remember that each animal is wild. So even though we know Karula incredibly well, you always approach a sighting with her or with any other animal as you would the very first time seeing them. And that is just to constantly watch their body language and observe how they're reacting to you. At the moment, everything about her body language is telling me that she's relaxed. Her tail is flopped down, twitches every now and again, but that's because of the flies. She's panting with her eyes half closed. She's got a nice full belly and a kill. She's not showing any signs of distress. And you saw how comfortably she walked right next to the car when she went to go lie down behind us. That would have been a very different thing if I tried to drive that close to her. If I tried to drive into her personal space like that, uh, she would probably have growled and run away. But because it was her choice to come to me, she was more than comfortable with it. in the distance and this is such a perfect setting for a sighting like this and Marjorie who is a 95 year old viewer in Yorkshire in the UK has sprained her ankle so she can't get out too much but this is one of the reasons why she is absolutely loving the safari that she can experience here Marjorie welcome I really am glad that this provides you with an opportunity to entertain yourself and I hope that your ankle heals up so you'll be out and about soon. It reminds Marjorie of her trip to Kruger 30 years ago. That's incredible Marjorie. 
It is really wonderful, and I'm so glad that we are able to bring you this opportunity. And I'm very pleased to introduce you, well, not introduce you to Karula, but to be able to share this world with you. had a couple of close photos of Karula over the last few weeks and I've seen a lot of photos that have gone up particularly the one that I'm thinking of is the one that was taken as they were driving past her on Gowrie Main, not us another vehicle with some guests and, oh there's Nanyana in the back sorry I'll be with you in one sec Shame. I hope that's not Mom. She's spotted. She spotted the leopard. Or at least she spotted something that she thinks is a leopard. We could well get a bark very soon. But because Karula's not showing any predatory signs of behavior, she's not slinking through the grasses. That Nyala might decide to work, to walk on. There she goes. She's just going to walk past. I have no reason for saying that it's probably the mother. I really honestly don't. She just looked like she walked into the drainage line searching for something. Might just have been because she's being extra cautious. had something similar happen this morning with Brent and his phantom leopard that had killed a baby kudu and the mother was or at least a female that was probably the mother was hanging around now just while we've got this view of her so difficult to see we're not quite close enough but Evan just to go back to your question about whether or not Karula's chipped canine will in any way damage her hunting ability. Oh, there comes another Inyala. This one she spotted. So maybe not the mother, maybe just a hapless group that's wandered through. They've all stopped to look at her, but they haven't done anything about it. And I think that's just because she's not presenting with them, presenting them with any kind of threat. That female instead of crossing no she is she's going to keep going you can see Karula is interested she's an opportunist here comes another Inyala <laughs> oh stop to look again is that a leopard I'm not quite sure I think it's a leopard better not take any chances oh but that good blade of grass is really yummy you might want to move along buddy from being very closely watched. See that shift in her body posture? She's not all that keen to go chasing after them. And the chances of her hunting them are fairly slim. But like any predator out here, just like Tingana the other day with his full round belly, she's an opportunist. And if the opportunity presents itself, it might be one she might take. She's still watching. There's actually quite a few in Yana that have just walked past. She's still keeping a close eye on them. Some of them didn't even stop to look across in her direction. So I think my initial assessment about the possibility of it being the mother was maybe potentially inaccurate, although they are in the right area, and in Yala do hang about in the same area. Okay. Let's try that question again. Sorry, I keep getting interrupted whilst trying to talk about her chipped canine that she has. She's an older leopard. They chip their teeth. It's nothing too serious. From what I can see where it is, it's not even terribly, it's not even a terribly big chip. It's just the tip that's come off. It might be more unpleasant for her if it were a little bit further up towards, possibly further towards the root system and the nervous system that is in the tooth itself. 
So that might have caused her additional discomfort and maybe made way for an infection or an abscess, which would definitely have caused her pain and eventually for that tooth to fall out. But I think that chip from where it is, it's not going to do anything. It damage her health in any way or in fact make her canines less effective. Um, it was a case of a leopard that was injured in some way. I'm trying to remember the story. This leopard was injured and hanging out around a camp. And because it was such a clever leopard, they were really struggling to dart it. And so eventually they put down a cage that caught him. It was a story that I heard years ago. And this leopard, because it was so frantic and scared within this wire mesh cage, actually pulled out both sets of canine teeth. So when they arrived the next morning and sedated it, it had already done severe damage. And it was decided that that combined with its injury meant that it couldn't be released into the wild. But what they did for that leopard was in the hood sprayed area. I can't remember precise details, but what they did for that leopard was they ended up giving that leopard false teeth, false canine teeth that were made of titanium, if I remember correctly just as an attempt to see if it could be done, and it was done. And that leopard was, did live happily, not completely wild, but in a very large enclosure, and he used to bring down his own food. And a happy end to what could have been a very sad story. But we don't need to worry about Karula and her dental hygiene. Plenty of fresh, raw bones. Keep her teeth and dentition nice and healthy. So it's one of the reasons why it's the teeth or the condition of the teeth are the best way of judging a big cat's age. It's where the clearest aging process occurs. like Karula Hunt, you get to see the voracious power and speed of that hunter and the way that she uses her claws to grab onto a prey item or prey animal and hold it. And Jen B was wondering, we see them with demonstrate such incredible strength and we saw her just now climbing that tree using her claws with the kill in her mouth. Jen was wondering, well then why do they not use their claws to either rip open a carcass or pull or move bits off it? And I'm sorry, I'm listening now. I get so distracted by the bird life that's in here. I'm hoping the little barred owlet that is calling is going to come a bit closer. <coughs> and hopefully that grey-headed bush right comes back as well. Sorry, Jen. Back to Karula's claws and the way that she uses them. To be completely honest, I think it's a lack of... Um, a lack of coordination and a lack of flexibility within the claw itself. So that instinctive stretch out when they grab an animal and hold it down is very much part of the flexing of the tendons and then climbing the tree as well. But I'm not sure exactly how much voluntary control they have over it. And that combined with the fact that the, the claw can't really move from side to side, although the paw can, but it's a very, it would be a very sort of, um, difficult to coordinate business. And that's just not how they're adapted to work. They use their teeth to do it. And rather than get a whole load of, or a buildup of blood and meat in the claw sheaths themselves, because of course the claws are hidden in cartilage sheaths on her paw. So rather than risking adding a whole bunch of the kill to that, they don't use them for it. But I think it's more just the fact that their teeth are work better than their claws do. Because claws do get dirty every now and again, so that can't be the sole explanation for why they don't do it. I just don't think they're coordinated enough, to be honest. And to just slow the process down. It's much easier to just use the mouth and swallow directly. And that's maybe another good reason. You don't want to waste time with a knife and fork, so to speak where you can eat directly from the plate, which is essentially what she does, rather than using her claws as a knife and fork to cut things up first and then to bite them. 
she just flies away. It's so amazing to think that I've done, I think we've all done bush walks in this area. This part of the drainage line is one of my favorites. And here we are sitting with, and now forever after I will associate this particular spot with Karula and how she kept us guessing this morning, but came through in the afternoon. Ivan, you were wondering how long she will save that kill, because surely in this kind of, in these kind of temperatures, without proper refrigeration and storage, the meat's going to go off. Ivan, she'll probably be finished at my guess, judging by how much is left, either by tonight or by sometime tomorrow morning. That's because it's quite a small kill. I've seen Karula feed off a dead impala for five days in midsummer. And the animals are not nearly, first of all, they're not nearly as fragile as we are. They've been building up the antibodies to eat rotten meat their whole lives. It, a a two-day-old carcass having to pick around the maggots is really not a problem. Yes, of course they prefer fresh, but they can't really afford to turn up their nose at anything. And their immune systems are more than capable of coping with a, with a meal like that. Much, much better to do it that way. So no worries there, although I do think that this tiny kill will probably be finished by tomorrow. She's done a really good job of hoisting that kill into a perfect tree. The Tamburti tree with its thick green leaves will help keep it safe. Deborah was wondering, why is it then that vultures don't find a kill in the tree? And the answer, Deborah, is that's why she's been, or that's why leopards are so clever in the places that they pick. They try to choose a tree with quite dense leaf cover rather than a dead tree or anything like that. And that essentially means that it is protected from vultures because they can't see underneath the canopy of the tree. But, there is a but to that. Oh, catch that fly, girl. Did you get it? There is an exception to that, and that is birds of prey like batteliers and tawny eagles in particular, but all the different birds of prey are not above scavenging off somebody else's kill, and they quite happily, oh, exhausted, hey? Tired, girl. They will quite happily fly beneath the canopy. They fly much lower than vultures do. But they've got a much better chance of spotting a leopard kill in a tree. When I first arrived here, there was in fact an impala or the remains of an impala kill exactly in the same spot where Karula has put that Nyalan right now. And it was almost immediately discovered by Batteliers and by tawny eagles, and they eventually fed on it to the point that they dislodged it, and the hyenas took the rest of it. So occasionally, leopards can lose their kills to birds of prey. It's fairly, it's not really directly from them because a leopard will be able to scare off a batelier or an eagle of some kind. It's just in the case where they've gone for a drink and those birds descend to have a quick bite. how subconscious that tail movement is. You sort of see what I mean. I mean, she's almost fast asleep, but there goes that tail, apart from the odd fly bugging her. <laughs> I 
And it's such an interesting thing because a leopard is so beautifully, beautifully camouflaged, except for that tip of the white tip of the tail. And of course, that has its reasons for being there. One is communication, visually, with other leopards. The other is a good way of helping cubs follow through long grass. And yet, it can potentially be such a disadvantage. I've seen a, a, a leopard give its position away while it was stalking, just by a seemingly involuntary movement of the tail. And Karula in particular, I've noticed, has a very twitchy tail. It moves constantly. All leopards do. But Karula seems to in particular. And it's... I wonder if they ever get frustrated with their tail for giving away their position. Beautiful sighting in this afternoon light. Hopefully that barred owlet comes a bit closer and maybe even that grey-headed bushrike decides to come back so that we can get a view of them. I don't think Karina's going to be up to terribly much for a little while, so let's find out what Brent's been up to. Do a bit of both. So we're still sitting here very quietly. The light is dropping beautifully, but still no sign of Mr. Phantom. Jenny, from where you are, this is behind So what we're going to do is we're going to go for a little loop, a little drive around, and come back here. A little later. Now, still, even though I can't see him, Always let the car run for a little bit before I move. Just want to double check as we move out. Maybe we see him sleeping somewhere. Okay. All right, we're going to get a spectacular sunset view, sir. While Karula is flat, we're just going to have a little dabble around this area. See what could be out and about. So, fascinating. And now we just have to hope Karula does bring her cubs back. Karula is quite far from here, uh, as the crow flies a couple of kilometers. So, unlikely that they will come into contact at the moment, especially since they're both sitting pretty on kills each of their own. Might have actually just stuck down here for a drink. So there's a pan here, so let's go have a look. Always pays to be checking carefully. I have an interesting uh, question from Nathan on uh, YouTube. Uh, Nathan is wondering, do any of the species on in this part of the world have sex for pleasure? Uh, or do any of them ingest toxins recreationally? Well, uh, Nathan, that's a very human thing to do, the, the second part. There's only one species that really has sexual congress for pleasure outside of human beings, and that is the used to be called the pygmy chimpanzee uh, or the bonobo. Now that lives in a very, very confined area. It's a very big confined area between the River Cross and the River Congo in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Uh, they are a close rela relative of human beings. And uh, so unlike chimpanzees, who will 
fight generally to sort out uh, any problem amongst the social group, bonobos will have sex. Uh, and both same sex, sex and orgies and they're very promiscuous little uh, primates. Oh, great apes, actually. So bonobo is the only animal I've ever heard of that, apart from dolphins, of course, as well, but in Africa, that is said to have sexual congress for pleasure. And in terms of using toxins recreationally, uh, no. Uh, certain animals will feed off toxins medicinally. So kudu, baboon, black rhino will eat timbuti and uh, euphorbia which are highly noxious plant species uh, to cleanse their system of uh, parasites. So intestinal worms, tapeworms and stuff, they have been known to feed off this very poisonous tree to purge the system. But not, I uh, think, in the way you were thinking, uh, Nathan, not as an hallucinogenic to go dance around the wilderness, because if you did that, you would probably be eaten by something, a lion or leopard or hyena or cheetah or wild dogs, for that matter. So nothing really takes, I think, the only recreational pastime of most of the animals out here is survival. So chatting about wild dogs, uh, they are not here. That's about the only update I can give you. I'm not exactly sure where the packs are at the moment. And at this time of the year, they do wander far and wide. Uh, they are mating at the moment and also assessing various different den sites. So ideally, we want to see them back here in the next couple of weeks, excavating old artfark burrows. We're about to head out into this really beautiful open area. Let's have a look at the sunset. Uh, the sun is getting low. It is one of those spectacular times of the day and I'm very excited about the sun setting because that phantom leopard might start feeding as it gets a bit cooler. And we're just doing a nice little loop. Uh, apart from leopards, it's been very quiet now wondering as we saw those buffalo bulls, but I haven't seen any uh, elephants this evening. Um, very few impala about as well. So with this green flush we're experiencing at the moment, uh, there is a tendency for a lot of the herbivores to spread over a wider area and are less concentrated. Uh, but I think give it a month, maybe, yeah, a month, month, month and a half, and we're going to start seeing nice concentrations of game again as the water dries up. So there is the sunset without a cloud in the sky. really do appreciate it, uh, Kevin. Uh, Kevin Geyer is watching via YouTube. He said, let me explain my absolute addiction to these live safari drives. Uh, Kevin says, I'm sitting in the parking lot before my next appointment. I went half an hour early 
not to read over my notes for work, but just so I could catch a little bit of the Sunset Safari. Well, thanks very much, uh, Kevin. We do really appreciate your support. And isn't it wonderful? You've got to see a leopard and hopefully two before the end. So Carlos has posed a very good question. He's wondering about some of these big open areas. Uh, he's wondering, are they made by humans or are they natural and but from grazing habits? So uh, quarantine clearings, which is the biggest clearing we have here on Juma, is a, a man-made clearing. That was a, an original quarantine station uh, for cattle when they tried to cattle farm here. So that area was cleared. But as we move into these, oh, look there. Yeah. Hello, little Stenbogi. And actually, for me personally, more interesting than that little Stenbog, if we come a bit closer to us, Viam, are we too, is he too close? Here we go. A pair of Koki Franklins. Very pretty. And one of the harder Franklin species to, to see. Now, their call sounds I've heard it described as the sound of rusty bed springs moving vigorously. I'll leave the rest to your imagination. Maybe he might give us a call. This is a good time of day for Cokies to call. So there apparently is a bit of argument over the spelling of Cokey Franklin. Now, it is a slightly strange spelling. It's C, oh, now I'm getting with you, C-Q-O-U-I, if I remember correctly, but I will double check for you. C-O-Q-U-I, Koki Franklin. Oh, there goes the female. Now, the one, Franklin, you can get confused is Koki and Shelley's, well, the female. So... Oh, there goes the male after the lady. And that little Stenbocky, oh, is still sitting there watching this going on. And there we go, that is how they get their name, a Stenbock, a brick buck because they don't move. Their main form of defense is to keep dead still. And because most predators' eyes are set for movement, that I've actually seen wild dogs run within f less than a, a meter from a, a steenbok lying flat in the ground and miss it completely. That's shame. If you stay staring at them too long, they start to get a little bit self-conscious, like they have been spotted. So we'll just pretend for his sake we haven't spotted him and we'll carry on. He didn't move a muscle. So, Carlos, sorry, we got sidetracked by those birds there. Now we come onto a clearing like this. Now, Carlos, this is what a, a natural clearing. You can see it's not completely clear. There are some shrubs and bushes in it. And this is what we call a seep line on a duplex soil. So it's sandy soil on top of clay. And the water seeps down from the top of the, the hills here. And where it gets very waterlogged in an area like this, your trees are very, very stunted, and your grass species are, are prefer this. It's a bit too wet for a lot of trees. So that's why you get these open areas. There's another one coming through here. And uh, very important, and this is where uh, a lot of your grazing animals will spend quite a bit of their time, your zebra and, and, and wildebeest and, and such. So very interesting and a really great question, Carlos. There we go, another edge of a seep line. So 
Marie, speaking of sunsets, we're about to see the last. Let me just sneak past this tree. The last of the sun disappearing behind the Drakensberg Mountains. And Marie is wondering, does the sun set at different times in South Africa? Uh, yes, it does, Marie, as it does all over the world. So every day it'll be setting a little bit earlier as we head into winter. It's just disappeared. There we go. We can see the Drakensberg Mountains. So every day it'll be disappearing a little bit earlier. The sun will also be rising a little bit later while we go through our winter months. And then as it turns after winter solstice, uh, every day it starts getting a little bit earlier. Uh, the sunrise and the sunset starts getting a little bit later. So we are about to head into our winter time changes. So me being me, I can't remember all those numbers, but uh, I will double check them for you now, or you can just log into blog, I think, or wildearth.tv's blog, and uh, you can see the time changes there. So we will be departing half an hour later in the mornings and uh, half an hour earlier in the afternoons. So just for those from the 1st of April, we will be going out on Sunrise Safari. Uh, ooh, pushing wrong button. I got, I got to check what this is. They even wrote it down for me so I didn't make a mistake and cause absolute pandemonium and confusion. Okay, a sunrise a safari will be changing to uh, Central African time, uh, 0, 0600 hours to 0, 0900 hours, In that is the sunrise safari. Oh, I'm making a hash of this. Um, and then it will be from midnight to 3 a.m. Uh, Eastern Standard Time, if you're in the eastern part of the United States. And um, it will be 9 p.m. to midnight Pacific Western Time. And that is the Sunrise Safari. So 6 a.m. Central African Time to 9 a.m. Um, 12 a.m. to 3 a.m. Eastern Standard. and. 12, I mean, 9 p.m. to 12 a.m. West, Pacific Western. Sunset safaris now. It'll be 15.30 to 16.30 Central African time and 09.30 a.m. to 12.30 um, p.m. on Eastern Standard and it'll be 06.30 a.m to 09.30 a.m. Uh, Pacific Western. So hopefully I didn't cause too much pandemonial or confusion and we managed to get through that without too much stress. Basically just means everything's gonna be half an hour later from the 1st of April. I don't know why they just didn't ask me to say that. That sounds a lot simpler to me. I don't know what you guys think. Musical's wondering why that Stanbok was by himself. He probably wasn't. Uh, there would have been a female close by. Uh, they don't live in herds. They live in monogamous pairs. And they have very small territories that they live in. So there's no need to live in a herd. They don't move around. So they stay within a small area of about four acres. And that's where he'll live for his life until he gets eaten by something. And. Uh, but they will be completely monogamous till one or one party gets eaten uh, and then they will start actively searching for another mate. Now, mono monogamous is probably the wrong word, so they will mate for life, they will stay together, but uh, male and female Stenbock, if they happen to find a, 
a sneaky bit on the side near the edge of the territory, they will take advantage of that as well. Do you see lion tracks on that road? Yes. Yeah. Uh, male or female lion tracks? Liam thinks he's spotted um, some lion tracks. I just want to check if it's the Birmingham's from a few nights ago or it's fresh tracks. Uh, it's the Birmingham's from a few nights ago. There we go. You can actually just see the male lion track over there. Well spotted though, VM. It always pays to double check these things. There we go, bump, bump. But it is the Birmingham's from the night they stole Tingana's dinner. So we are about to, we're quite close to where the mystery leopard is, and it is a little bit darker. I would prefer it to be a little bit darker still, but we'll go have a look. Let's go have a look, and um, if we've got nothing there, we'll just, you know, as we do, send you across to another leopard. No big deal, guys. Nothing serious. Aren't we lucky? So as it's got cooler as well here, you might find he might move out from under the thickets where he's sleeping just to enjoy uh, the, the cool air of the evening. So fingers crossed we do get a decent visual of him today. We had quite a fantastic visual of him on yesterday's sunset safari and it's amazing to see that progress even in that short time how he became far more relaxed around the vehicles. is in the tree so as I've been doing every time we've been approaching here calm into low range keeps the ribs very nice and stable and quiet avoids big fast movements and I am talking I want him to get used to the sound of people talking and learn that it's not a threat I mean nothing he needs to run away from so we just go ever so slowly sorry I've got a bug in my eye Fortunately, I'm able to extract these things myself. No need for outside help. Oh, I long knife. <laughs> See, exactly why. Pim just said he brought his long knife. Exactly why I'll extract them myself. Okay. Got him, Vim. He's in the tree. We're staying a little even further than we were earlier. There he is. Isn't that spectacular? It is quite far for any sort of real identification features to stick out. But it's just. I hope he relaxes and carries on feeding. I don't want him to rush down the tree, so I'm not going to move at all from where I am now. Look at that. Isn't that incredible? Just to think he was running at high speed from vehicles not even 24 hours, or maybe a little bit more than 24 hours ago. So 
so it has been even though we couldn't see him that just sitting nearby here and talking and being in the area would have just given him that little bit more confidence uh, that it is a we're not posing a threat to him just make out the crunching of bones from here. Now these might not be the best photographs I take, but they're gonna be a few of the more rewarding ones, that's for sure. So a little bit of patience with these animals goes an incredibly long way. Unfortunately, I think he might finish this kill tonight. But we've got a good start in, in the habituation process. We do have such fantastic viewings of leopards on kills and trees, and this is definitely, in terms of the actual visual, probably not quite up there. But for me, it is one of the best I've had since I've been at Safari Live. Diana says, I swear I thought I could hear him chewing. And well, I can, Diana, so it is possible that that top mic is picking it up. Vim, how do you feel about this? Happy. Vim's very happy. Vim likes filming phantoms. As he said to me, the harder the leopard to film, the better before we headed out today. Massachusetts would like to know what would the name phantom be in one of the local languages? Well, Valeria, I'm going to have to go ask and get back to you. Sorry, I think Aubrey's just looking for me. Right, here we go. Jamie's taking care of it for me. That he's relaxing, feeding quite nicely. I'm not going to try go any closer just yet, but once it's darker, we might be able to get a little closer. And I have brought along a special thing with us because we don't know where he comes from. So I've got my little poo collector. So this is to collect leopard scat for genetic research. So definitely tomorrow morning. If that carcass is finished completely, um, I'll come in here and we'll have to scratch around. I'm pretty sure he's defecated quite close to the base of that tree. And hopefully we'll be able to get some uh, scat for DNA and send that off for that ongoing Panthera genetics pro project.
Shannon is asking me to take a picture and then zoom in to show you. Fortunately, Shannon, even with my camera in this light, I'm struggling. So it's not a very clear picture. You can just see it's a leopard. You can just make out a few rosettes. So, so unfortunately, even with my camera, you can see very high and grainy. And he is very far away, even for this lens. So that's what you're seeing while he's feeding. So if we zoom out, this is, if I zoom out, that's my camera at full zoom is what I'm getting. So very similar to what you guys are seeing. We will try and get a little bit closer as it gets darker. But for now, I think just staying here and keeping a nice distance. Then he can get really relaxed while he's feeding in the tree before we even think about moving an iota or even a meter off the road. So Anne in Texas is wondering, is it instinctual for leopard to carry their kills up trees or they're taught by their mother? Uh, it is very much instinctual and a lot of uh, animal behavior out here is all instinctive. It's, it's not learned behavior. There's very, very little learned behavior amongst specifically the predators. Um, you might find a little bit with cheetah uh, and occasionally with lion and leopard, but again, I think that's more happenstance than, than actual teaching itself. So definitely instinctual to take kills up the tree. He's feeling nicely now, and he's definitely feeling more secure as it gets darker. Canada Keith is wondering how many leopards are now active on Juma? Well, let me do the numbers. Uh, Karula, Shadow, Tingana, Karula, Shadow, Tingana, Mvula. Um, this young male. Mm, I think that's about it. Um, we do occasionally get other leopards wandering through, through, but not regularly. Even Mvula's sort of on the edges. So I'd say for definite shadow, Karula, Tingana, and this young male has been seen and his tracks have been found quite regularly. So Sheila says, when he finishes this kill, he will move on. Will this not interrupt the habituation process? It most certainly will, Sheila, but um, whenever you habituate an animal, that's how it is. I mean, we'll have to track and find him again. That's the only way to do it, the good old fashioned way. And it is quite a, it is a very rewarding way to do it as well. I have tested him with a spotlight this morning already and he was fine. Just to give you a little bit more light in that position.
Look at that. Just repositioning so you can feed on it better. Oh, sorry, that's what that is. I just need to find a good place to balance it. So BJ, I was wondering, is this unknown leopard in another leopard's territory? Uh, it most certainly is. He's in Tingana's territory, but he is a nomadic male, so he'll move around between different territories. Uh, but he has seemed to be whoopsy around here for a while. Sorry about that. The spotlight decided it didn't like its precarious position I balanced it in. Let's try a little bit less precarious then. That's definitely more precarious. I'm trying to balance it. There we go. To the right. Oh, yeah. I think we got it now. Theron was trying to catch me looking silly while I was trying to balance spotlights. It's an absolutely magic moment sitting here with this leopard. The sun's going down. He definitely knows we're here. He's listening to me, but he's chosen to ignore and he's just carrying on feeding. So he is still quite far away from us. Oh, look at that. He might jump with the, the kill to move it into a better place. Oh, no, he's just going to pivot. So I'm going to sit here for a bit longer before I try to get a little bit closer. I want it to be a couple of shades darker. And so he's feeling more in his element. You know, he's actually turned his back to us. So already that slight more element of trust being shown now already, just from sitting quietly, well, not so quietly, but just from sitting and keeping the distance initially and just, just being patient with him. Well, Desert Eagle, who's a new viewer on YouTube, welcome. And it says, hey Brent, is this live? You're getting a bit, a bit close to that leopard. This can't be live. Well, Desert Eagle, we're not close to a leopard yet. Um, we're busy habituating this guy. He's not used to uh, game drive vehicles. 
And so sorry as well, we are very much live. So you're watching this leopard while I sit next to him. And in a little while, you'll see how close we can get to a leopard that's been fully habituated. Because Jamie has got the dominant female leopard from this area at the moment. And she's also got a kill, probably about two and a half kilometers from where we're sitting right now. So, Desert Eagle, you want to see how close we can get to a leopard? I think now is the perfect opportunity. While I try to move a little bit closer to this guy, let's go see how close you can get to a truly habituated leopard. What an awesome afternoon that we've been able to spend as much time as we have with two different leopards, two different sightings, both with kills in a tree. Karula's been having a rather extended break from her meal. Still panting heavily with that enormous belly of hers. She's feeling a little bit full. And rather hot and tired. Desert Eagle. Desert Eagle apparently watching us and wondering if this really is live. Or, and the fact that Brent was as close as he was to a leopard was astounding him. Desert Eagle, just to give you a rough idea, we're very fortunate. This is a particularly relaxed leopard. Her name is Karula. And she is about, what would I say? Let's go with seven, eight meters away from where I am. And that's the position she chose to be in, not that I chose for her. So 24 odd feet away, depending on where you're from. So I really hope you are enjoying your live experience. Now it's got a little bit cooler, so hopefully she does decide to go up towards the tree. I'm pretty sure Brent has explained this to you, but I'm just gonna mention it as well. The reason that we're staying with Karula, where we didn't stay with Tingana, with his impala kill and at night after dark with spotlights. The big difference, of course, being that both this, uh, both Karula and the mystery leopard have their kills up a tree, so any extra distraction won't lose them their kills. Whereas with Tingana, his kill was still on the ground, and in fact, he did end up losing it that night anyway. So that's just one of the reasons and the explanation behind our different approaches to different sightings. And if, of course, if I thought she was anywhere near where her den site is, we would also have closed the sighting. But I don't. I don't think she is at all. We're much, much further north to the last known den site. Here comes Aubrey. He's also going to come and join us in the sighting. And hopefully going to provide us with some spectacular lighting. Oh, flies. Karula is sharing a problem that is plaguing Jandre and myself as well. And that is the fact that the mosquitoes down in this drainage line are absolutely... Sorry, just give me one second. Just making sure that the light isn't blinding Aubrey. Aubrey, just want to check up with him. Yes, the mosquitoes down here are definitely out in full force, and that is the problem. And that's what's plaguing her. Aubrey, is my light okay, or is it blinding your guests? Okay, copy, thanks. Just making sure that Aubrey's guests don't have a face full of LED light. It has been a truly picturesque afternoon that we've spent with this stunning leopard. We've been down here in the drainage line. Giandre and myself barely moved since we got down here and first spotted her. And we've just had a, such a wide variety of bird calls. Different birds have come through at different times. The starlings, this 
barred owlet, the grey-headed bushwhack. And the wonderful thing about drainage lines is that you see far more than you hear. And in fact, Chandra and myself even had an elephant come past, but it was so quick that by the time we'd registered what was happening, it, was already dis it had already disappeared from view. This is definitely, I think, the way to approach things, huh, Jandre? Hmm. Very pleasant afternoon. Sitting in a drainage line, plenty of shade. Leopard on hand. Kevin Geyer, the reason I'm chuckling, is Kevin Geyer is just, des just describing his approach or his current approach to the safari and I've drives. Now, Kevin would like to describe, in his words, not his, the extent of his, of his safari live addiction. He has arrived 30 minutes early for an, his next appointment and is currently sitting in his car watching. And he arrived 30 minutes early, not so that he could prepare for the meeting, but so that he could watch a little bit of our show instead. Well, Kevin, I'm very, very happy to hear that. And I'm glad that we've been able to provide you with something wonderful to look at in those 30 minutes before your appointment. There's no better mood setter, I think, than spending time with these magnificent animals. And let's, speaking of spending time with magnificent animals, I think Brent has managed to get a little bit closer to our mystery leopard. Let's go and have a look. Look at this, guys. We're so much closer, and he's almost giving us the quintessential leopard silhouette. And look at that. He's still feeding. Uh, we're probably about all wet for it. Here it comes, the back of the leopard ears in the fork of the tree with the fading light behind him. There it is. Isn't this amazing? Just that little bit of patience has really paid off with this guy. We're now probably 50% closer than where we were. And we're just gonna enjoy him as a silhouette for now before we pop the spotlight on. I am in awe at the moment. Incredibly, incredibly special moment. It's taken us three drives. Four, this is the fourth, which is really, really great. It means there's definite potential for this leopard. It seems like you heard me. quickly so you can have a look. Now you can see how much closer we are to him. We can actually see him and when he turns his face we might actually get some decent screenshots and uh, photographs that we might be able to get some IDing features of this guy. Sorry, a bit wobbly. I've got to hold the spotlight quite high to get above those bushes. Wow, isn't this magnificent? Now, where have you come from, mister? 
Oh, we might get a face look. There we go, he's looking. He's not actually looking at us. Oh, that's the flies. <laughs> oh, isn't this amazing compared to how far we had to stay yesterday? Oh, look, look at that. Now, if he stops and starts feeding, facing us, I feel like I've won a battle. There we go. Maybe he's a bit older than we initially thought. It's difficult to say. I hope you guys are getting some incredible shots. Oh, look at that. Look at that. See, he doesn't have that big developed dewlap like Tingana, so a little bit younger, but he is going to be a big boy. Now, this is definitely one of my most memorable leopard sightings since I've joined Safari Live. And it just happened. And it just happened. And it happened live, and I was able to share it with all of you guys out there. Now, it's very seldom you get to see this type of habituation process, and it's been amazing. And thanks for the support, guys, because I know it can get a little bit boring sitting in one spot. But as I often say, patience is the most important thing when it comes to seeing these things. Looks like he's finished feeding. He's gonna come down the tree. Or he might just have a snooze over there and a bit of a clean. Oh, look at that. Now, Vim, are you, are you both hands on camera? Mm -hmm. uh, I was gonna ask you to hold the spotlight for a second so I could try to get it. A photo, so for spot patterns. Okay, give me a spot, okay. So VM, I'm just passing the spotlight to VM. I'm just going to try get a photograph of his face, so we can get some IDs. Let me just make sure my settings are correct. They look good. We definitely go manual focus in this light. One more second, sorry, Vim. I just want to make sure that wasn't slightly out of focus. I felt it might be. I'll lift your head again, Mr. So we, all the settings are right. We just need him to lift his face and look at us again. I know you're cleaning, but still. Okay, here it comes. No, not quite yet. Well, we're definitely getting the one side of his face, now we just need the other. Sorry, Vim. <laughs> He's very intent on cleaning. Okay, come on, come on. Enough licking of paws. We just want one shot of your pretty face. I'm getting tired holding up my camera. Oh, yeah, I think it's coming, Bim. Sure. It's possible that he hasn't looked up because he feels quite secure in the tree. Normally, even with a bout of licking like this, often I just look up and check around. Oh, and then I'm sleeping. 
here it comes. Oh no, he's still cleaning. And he's still up. There we go. You are stunning. There we go. Looks like he might come down now. What a beauty. I got a gap through there. There we go. I'm just trying to make sure there's light on his face. He's going to come down the tree. And I've lost sight of him now. Oh, there's his tail. I just saw his tail disappear. Now, he might head off for a drink now or he might just lie down there. Now, we've had such a fantastic sighting. I don't want to put any more pressure on him tonight. And I'm, I'm just hoping he's going to give us that one more morning with him. But very exciting. Let's have a quick look here. So, oof, it's going to be quite difficult. But we'll have a look. So it looks like he's a, a three, possibly three male. And there we go. Oh, maybe four, three. Or three, four, sorry. He was quite far. So there's definitely three on the right. The left hand side is the one we're struggling for at the moment. Start out. Might be able to get a nice one on the left there. There we go. I think he's a 3-3. Three, three. Isn't that spectacular? You can see he doesn't have that big developed dewlap like Tingana yet. But notice he's got a very distinct right ear as well. Let's just zoom in there. It looks like a little nick off the top. That is awesome. So exciting. Yay! So even if he's not here tomorrow morning, we will be here to see if we can collect some of his feces. Um, I'm just going to... Oh, he's actually watching us. He's come a bit closer to us. You see him there, Vim? I might have to move. But he's, he's still cleaning. He's actually come closer to us. There he is. Maybe with the darkness, he's feeling a bit more brave. And there we go. You can actually see that little kink in his ear I was talking about there through the gap. About all we can see. Um, since he's come closer to us, I'm going to just try to start the vehicle. And I'm just going to keep my eyes on him when I start. And he's just cleaning at the moment. So again, Start the car, let it run, and he's continued to clean himself. So maybe we might be able to get a shot of him again on the ground. So there is a nice little clearing there. And Vim and I, when we first came in here, we very much zigzagged in. And now I'm going to do something quite strange. Now, the reason for that is I don't want to drive directly at him at any point. So instead of... I have to do a bit of windy, windy driving. That's fine. So instead, you really, especially with unrelaxed animals, it's much better if we do it this way. Reverse light on. A nice little open clearing gap. But in, 
even though we are getting a little bit close to him, it might look to him like we're actually going away because we're reversing away from him. We'll sleep him just behind that termite mound. Look at that. This is amazing. I'm just going to try and get us on. I'm just going to try and sneak us out into the right spot here. But he hasn't moved while we've been moving. So he's just behind here. Um, how much? Oh, yeah, that's about the end of backwards. So I, it, it, it does seem quite awkward the way I'm driving, but I'm just trying to ensure we don't drive directly at him. There he is. Oopsie. Not looking too perturbed at all. This isn't this special. He has picked up, he's heard something, and it's not us he's concentrating on. Maybe you can hear Tingana miles away calling up for territory. Uh, just judging from his behavior at the moment, I'm quite confident. I'm just going to turn my front lights on, see if I can. There is a place where we can maybe try to get a view of him. Well, he's not behind so much grass. And you see, leopards are so much more relaxed at night, uh, specifically ones that aren't normally too relaxed, like this gentleman. Hey, big boy. There's a hyena. Guaranteed there's a hyena arrived. You saw him hissing. Like that, that's not at us at all. Um, let me just check. I think there's a hyena here somewhere. Did you see that hiss? That was impressive. Thanks, Wayne, and many others who say this process of habituation has been completely fascinating. Well, it's so nice. I mean, he's not the most unrelaxed leopard that we've ever, I've ever worked with, but it is great to see such uh, progress in such a short time. And I do think there is something that he's hissing at, and it's definitely not us. OK, so now another very important thing. We're not going to move when he's moving. Hills left. There's a fair little bit up in the tree. Sorry, there's a branch in front for you guys. Okay, it looks like he's stopped now. There we go. I told you. I knew it. Howard's here. So that's exactly what he was hissing at. Coming to pick up the scraps. I'm just going to see. There he is. There. Sorry, Vim. I wasn't watching my one at I'm just so focused on. There. He's lying just there behind those bushes and just catches the eye every now and then. But that hiss, just that pure unbridled aggression that he showed, was definitely not at us, but at the spotted hyena. He's picking up all little, little bits of 
dribs and drabs that have been dropped. Now, here's a perfect example why we only really view leopard kills that are in trees at night. Now, did this hyena come from our spotlight or did it smell? Difficult to say, but I know for a fact in other parts of the Sabi Sands, the hyenas have definitely learned to check on spotlights at night. And look how full this hyena is. Our hyenas around here don't seem to uh, be hungry at all. They always seem to have a full belly. We're picking up all the little bits and pieces that have been dropped by the leopard is feeding. It does look like she's got some fly bites that are bleeding on her left ear. So yeah, I'm just going to go, wait, let me, I know what to do. I'll put that one in the hyena so I can check on the leopard. So he's still there. And not too much of the carcass left. Maybe enough for one more morning with this guy. Special sunset safari it's been so far. So, Desert Eagle, our new, our new viewer from this afternoon, said, um, This guy, I assume referring to me, said I, he knew there was going to be a hyena there, and then there was a hyena. Well, fortunately, the leopard told me, I just saw that snarl, and that type of aggression with leopards is generally reserved for the scavenging spotted hyena. Yes, you, miss. I see he's still, he's lying down, he's fast asleep there. He's not too worried about the hyena. His meat is safely up in the tree. So that hyena's picking up a tiny little bit, of, little bit of bones and meat that the leopard has dropped while it's feeding. Now, one of the reasons hyenas are so successful is their absolute patience. I've watched hyenas spend four days under a leopard kill to literally almost eat tiny bits of bone fragments that were dropped. But they are incredibly adaptable creatures. Check where he is again. So we're going to try and get one last view of this leopard as we move out of this area, and then I think we'll leave him be. And we'll definitely be back here first thing tomorrow morning. Just try to get one last glimpse. So obviously he's, he could be a little bit more nervous, but you just saw from that snarl he's far more focused on the hyena being here than on us now. There he is. Maybe he'll give us a nice view again. How's that been? 
is. He's going to sorry, try and get spotlight in a good spot. Oh, he's behind a tree for you. I think I need to just go forward for VM a little bit. Sorry, guys, just, it's a bit awkward because uh, VM's behind me and I'm not in the best spot. But there we go. So he's now only about, what do you say, VM 15? Mm, maybe 20. 20 meters from us. And just to think how far we started off viewing him from. Now, during the day, we're probably not going to get this close to him, but we'll definitely be able to get closer than we did on the first day. Happy, fat and full leopard. And I'm not going to push our luck and try to go any closer this evening. Maybe in the next time we come across him, he'll, he'll let us come a little closer, fingers crossed. But what a spectacular couple of days it's been with this leopard and a couple of drives. And isn't this a fantastic culmination? But we're going to leave him be, keep hissing at the hyenas, big boy. And hopefully we'll see you bright and early on tomorrow's sunrise safari. In the meantime, uh, let's go see how the queen of Juma is faring with Jamie. This is so exciting this afternoon to have had that experience and to have this, got that leopard to the point where he is so relaxed. In the meantime, the queen is starting to show signs of stirring from her grassy throne and moving off towards the kill. Or was that perhaps just a false alarm? She's still very hot and very full and quite happy to just enjoy some relaxation. And the drainage line wall with all of its thick, soft grass is a perfect spot for her to lie. She's picked a good spot as well to have this kill. This kill is lots and lots of water close by. There's a whole series of pans on our western side and actually our eastern side. Sorry, there's quite a few of them. So whenever she decides she wants to go and have a drink, there will be easily available water. Head still drooping. Blair, who is watching in British Columbia, Blair wanted to just know a little bit about how you spell Karula, since there's been something of a disagree, or there's been a little bit of a disagreement about it. The traditional spelling of Karula's name and this particular individual, Karula. Now, I've encountered one or two animals called Karula in my life, but this particular individual, tradition sort of dictates it's spelled K-A-R-U-L-A. The difference being that that's not actually how it would be phonetically spelled. It is not an English word. It is a word meaning peace from the local languages, or peaceful. And according to the, the, the phonetics of the way that you would spell that in that language, it would be K-U-R-U-L-A. So that's where the confusion is setting in. That, in fact, is the technically correct spelling. But the Karula with an A is the spelling that's been adopted from the beginning of her life. So I think probably if we're going to choose, just to stick with what we know, K-A-R-U-L-A. -A. And the meaning is the same. I mean, anybody who, whenever you say Karula, we know exactly which leopard we mean. Oh, getting so dozy. And bear in mind, of course, oh, exhausted. Bear in mind that a lot of the local languages have different 
approaches to spelling in different dialects. So something that might be spelled one way in one language, just a couple of hundred meters or hundred kilometers down the road, could be spelled completely differently. Whoop. I'm not sure how clearly you heard that funk of the dung beetle that just decided to join us on the bonnet. It crashed. It's amazing how... It's amazing how dung beetles, for all of their evolution, they haven't evolved a suitable landing mechanism. Oh, tunneling under my under my fingers. It's incredible how strong they are. Oh. He's pushing, pushing up against me. Shame, buddy. Sorry, I'm just turning down my game drive channel at the same time. Had it turned up a little bit too loudly. One of the species of whoopsie Sorry, dude. Dung beetle. Shame. I don't want to add to his further disorientation. So I'm going to let him be on his way. Look at the spines all over his feet for gripping. Shame. That was such a crash landing into the bonnet. All right, buddy. All right. I know, I know, I know, I know. It almost feels like he's biting me, but he's not. He's just so strong pushing with his legs. All right. Okay. You're fine. And he's just got those spurs that dig in. So it does feel almost like he's trying to chew his way out. Okay. I'm going to let him go. I'm going to return him to the dark. Here we go, buddy. Sorry, I can't get out to give you a gentler landing. But they're absolutely fine. They're so resilient. I mean, you heard how hard he hit that bonnet, and he was absolutely fine. Oh. While all of that was happening, we lost Andrew. I didn't even realize. <laughs> I wasn't even paying attention. Hi, Andrew. Alejandra and myself were actually sitting in complete pitch darkness while you were with Brent, just due to the fact that with all of our rain that we've had, it has certainly brought a variety of insect life that we haven't otherwise seen this season. And that includes dung beetles, moths, and as I mentioned earlier, the mosquitoes. And it feels as though Jandre and myself have been gaining a new, a new bite per minute, if not two new bites per minute. I'm not sure which of us is winning here, but definitely have incredibly itchy toes and ankles, which is the spot that they love. They've been plaguing Karula as well. And mosquitoes can and do feed off other animals apart from humans. Let's give it a bit more light. There we go. Valeria, I'm really glad that you've enjoyed this particular drive. Brent and myself both playing a patience game in a different way. Brent in terms of making really difficult decisions about how to approach this leopard. And we're so fortunate to have someone with that level of experience in doing stuff just like that. And myself just waiting for Karula to decide whether or not she's actually going to get up this afternoon or if she's decided this is where she's going to stay. But spending time with animals and having patience is one of the most important qualities that you can have out here or the most important approaches. It's the secret to wildlife filming. The best shots and the most exciting moments and the most exciting sightings sometimes happen on the spur of the moment, but most of the time it's hours and hours spent with the animal. And we couldn't be luckier than to spend our afternoon sitting in a peaceful drainage line in the shade. She's picked a perfect spot. She's put her prey in the tree, so she could well be here tomorrow. It's just a perfect setting for all of us. We are really lucky. And if you as the viewers are lucky, we are probably luckier 
and I'm glad that we can share it with you. Now, my, my next step is to figure out how I'm going to get out of here. <laughs> the only road runs here. Right, so pretty much in the way, or right next to her. I don't want to drive that close to her. I feel as though it's going to upset her and her sense of personal space and boundaries. So I'm going to have to try and figure out if I cannot get out of this drainage line a different way. I was very much hoping that she would decide to move, maybe go back and have a quick snack on her kill so that she'd provide us with a path out of here. But it seems as though she's decided she's not going anywhere, as is, of course, her prerogative. We shall just have to... Yes, she's, she's, um, she's utilising the royal prerogative, and we shall just have to make our way a different route. Find our different way out of here. I'm sure we'll manage it, no problem. Oh, hopefully, <coughs> this morning, we should be able to come back and find her, same place as she is now. She'll probably, at some point tonight, go for a wander back to the cubs, give them a good feed, and then return to the rest of the carcass. I imagine that that's what she's got planned for her night. Apart from the odd ear twitch to rid herself of mosquitoes, she's not so showing any signs of getting up just yet. And on the subject of the various insects that are currently fluttering all around us, Hope Community has suggested peppermint oil to help us out with our mosquito bites and to keep them at bay. Thank you. That is a really useful suggestion. Now, if I thought... Well, I mean, you know, you never predict how an afternoon is going to go, but if I had thought about putting bug spray on before I went out, that would also probably have helped. As it is, though, at the moment, any strong-smelling bug spray like that, even if I had guests, I would probably be telling them not to put it on close to her. I would be telling, I would pull them out of the sighting so that they could spray themselves down with bug spray and then come back in. Just to, because that strong, strong smell of bug spray really does upset animals, as does the, the sort of the ch sound. So that initial application, I've always made guests do away from the animals. Peppermint oil? I don't think they'd be too stressed for, stressed by. I'm gonna have to go and find some peppermint oil to put on my itchy bites. Luckily for me, mosquito bites don't get, don't stay itchy for too long. Keith, one last message from you. Keith in Long Island has just said that these sunset safaris have cut so much into his productivity, but that he would not have it any other way. Fair enough, Keith. I'm fortunate in that this is me being product productive. This is my productivity for the day. That's, I think that's pretty, I wouldn't have it any other way either. We've been so incredibly lucky to have spent the afternoon and I'm really thrilled because it's been a long time since I've seen the Queen of Juma, or it's certainly felt like a long time since I've had a nice long sighting with her. So to be able to spend this amount of time with her is really very special, and I'm very excited to start again and find her once again on the Sunrise Safari tomorrow. You'll just have to tune in and see if she's managed to squeeze the rest of the Anyala in overnight or if she has to come back. Well, we're drawing to the close of another beautiful afternoon in the African, African bush. I'm just going to say a big thank you to Jean-Dre for all of his wonderful camera work and to Ajeri in final control. And I'm also going to say goodbye to you all on behalf of Brent and Viam and to say thank you on their behalf. They're just heading back to camp now. So have a wonderful day wherever you are in the world and thank you so much for your questions and your comments. We really do appreciate it. I'm going to leave you with one last view of a sleepy, curled, spotty cat. <laughs>